Good morning. Welcome to webinar number 38. Yes, AWC webinar 38. I noticed in one of our past recordings, I said 32. It was a wrong number, so now I'm having to double check. Uh, my name is Alex Bassini. I'm the business development manager and one of the water treatment specialists here at AWC. I'm joined by Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining so today us today. Yes, that's right. Today we're going over EDI, electro deionization. It's quite the mouthful. It is technically, you know, you start with ionization, then deionization, and now we're doing electro deionization. Um, this is something that's coming up a, a lot. Um, even we've been working on a few projects with EDI. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. And so as we've been able to partner with them on a couple of these projects. What's pretty neat about this is that it's not just subject to a very specific industry, but it is a very specific process, so it can be used across multiple industries, which is why we're kind of touching up on that. Uh, so before we get started, this of course is part of a nice long uh, webinar series that we've been doing now for over a year. There's a lot of uh, a lot of information to go through. If you ever have a chance, please make sure you can log into our um, YouTube channel and go over them if you've missed any of them or you'd like to take some notes. Uh, I know that we're going to leave some space for some questions, some time for questions at the very end. I have a long list of questions myself, but we'll, we'll save some for those and we will be open for, for more questions once we, we wrap up. Um, a little bit about AWC, um, AWC Water Solutions. We design and build water treatment plants. Uh, we've been around for 40 years and we have close to 600 package plants uh, worldwide. Um, we divide everything into three categories, which is where EDI kind of plays in. So of course, we've got our potable plants, uh, wastewater plants and skid mounted systems. What's neat about EDI, EDI, and that's actually going to be one of the questions I have, and I, I won't start with questions because you haven't even started the presentation, John, Tom, excuse me, uh, but you do need some pre-treatment when you go to EDI, but I, I will leave you uh, to cover some of that. So with that, um, let's get started. Tom, take it away. Thank you. I'm going to maximize, and here we go. So electro deionization, as Alex uh, mentioned, fits into the whole water treatment train with some pretreatment that I, I will touch on. So I will take you now to the evolution of demineralization and where and how EDI came into the picture. Um, oh, my, excuse me, Tom. I don't think you're sharing your screen yet. Okay, sorry about that. Let's go share screen first. My apologies. Oh, no worries. Are you seeing my screen now? No, not yet. There we go. It didn't. Is being a little stubborn at first. So yeah, we can see it now. OK. Perfect. And that was without two screens going. So <laughs> my name is Tom Koshir. A very quick introduction. I work for Suez Water Technologies on the eCell EDI product line. The um, history here is through many different roles, so I've got quite a bit of uh, uh, time on anything from R&D through customer facing roles and uh, a number of technical roles. Today I do application development, uh, which uh, sounds like one thing, but is many things. One of those things is it gives me the opportunity to talk to customers about the product line from a technical point of view, and also from the point of view of what EDI does and where it does it, or to put it another way, who it does it for. So that's where I wanted to start. And then I will get into some of the technical details of how an EDI works. So to start with uh, the demineralization train from many years ago and where the kind of thing we will still see today is some pretreatment that I'm not going to get into very much today, just uh, touching on uh, to show it's there, followed by strong acid cation, strong base anion and mixed bed deionization. There may be some kind of decarbonation in here between uh, some of these DIs uh, to remove uh, CO2 mainly when we're talking about the kind of water that we're interested in in the mixed bed DI uh, outlet. Mixed bed DI is generally for high purity water needed for boiler feed. 
in microelectronics and pharmaceutical, chemical process industries, hydrocarbon process industries, mining, pulp and paper, steel, oil and gas, uh, general industrial. There are a lot of different uses, but it's that high purity water piece that we're looking at. The light blue here is highlighting that to run these, we need a lot of acid and a lot of base in order to keep these producing good quality water. So the strong acid cation and the SAC part of the mixed bed, which has to be separated from the SBA, uh, when we are no longer making a quality of water needed, then remove them, regenerate them, put them back and start the batch process all over again. At the same time as we do the acid, we're doing the strong base. This is a very reliable process, um, well known, but the chemical usage is starting to become a real concern for a lot more people. Um, in many places, they're, uh, they're seeing a lot more regulation on usage and transportation of chemicals. And uh, frankly, using these chemicals in these high uh, volumes is not a lot of fun for operators either. So there are a lot of good reasons to, to be able to reduce that chemical usage. The first step on that journey was on the middle part, going from strong acid cation, strong base anion, to in some cases, one single pass of reverse osmosis. So that can replace that primary cation and anion exchange in some cases. Uh, it's not necessarily going to do the identical job, but it does the big bulk demineralization. And it does it with less chemical, a smaller footprint, and lower height. That leads the way into uh, the next step, uh, mixed bed, still there uh, at this point. Um, as a reminder for uh, anyone who might not have been there at the time, but RO more or less came on the market commercially about 1977. At that time, um, it was still um, at the polishing step of uh, ion exchange. Um, there was certainly some EDI around, but it was not very common. The acid and base usage then in this kind of uh, operation was greatly reduced, but was still there. The mixed bed was still needed for producing that high quality water needed by those industries. The great thing about reverse osmosis from my selfish point of view, which is as someone representing the EDI product line for my company is that this produces the perfect kind of water for EDI. So EDI needed reverse osmosis to pave the way for it. Reverse osmosis, does a great job removing high molecular weight organics and removes the contaminant ions down to a level that EDI can process to make that same mixed bed quality of water for all of those industries, certainly when it can do it. Like I said with the RO, it's not necessarily doing the identical job that mixed bed is doing, but it's making similar quality water. There are places to make sure that we're very clear on this, there are times when EDI is not going to be a substitute for mixed bed, whether that's a technical reason or a commercial reason. Um, one of the advances we've made over the years with EDI is make it commercially, financially more and more competitive with mixed bed, but there are still going to be technical reasons in some cases not to be able to use it. But EDI accomplished many of the same things at a site that RO did at the primary cation and exchange. Less chemical, smaller footprint, lower height. So putting these two together, we have now is two unit operations. Sometimes you can have more than one pass of each. Uh, maybe you do some caustic injection into the RO in order to handle the CO2 that used to be done with the decarbonator tower. But the only chemical you now need for an EDI is not for regeneration. I'll tell you why that is in a few slides, but you may need to clean it once in a while. Across our fleet, it's most common to clean it once to four times a year, although there are sites that 
never have to clean their EDI, EDIs over years of use. So in those cases, they're not using any chemical. It's all electricity. The RO might still need some chemical for anti-scalant, perhaps some biocides. That's it for operation and then chemicals for cleaning. That's much less chemical. It's not even on the same scale as what's needed for all of that ion exchange. Uh, it can be as much as a 96% reduction in chemical usage, assuming regular cleanings on both the RO and EDI, and an even greater reduction if you have one of those sites that just doesn't need to clean their EDIs. So this uh, now gets us to an advantage uh, financially in another area, which is the building, because now for greenfield sites with two unit operations that are lower height, lower footprint, you can make a smaller building. In brownfield sites, you may be able to recover some space for other things that you want to do at your factory. So this is, uh, this is giving us some savings that go beyond the specific two unit operations in the process showing on this slide. Okay, so where can we, where can we put EDI? Well, basically anywhere that a mix bed can go, EDI can go, again, with the caveat that not every, not every application, I'm gonna talk a little bit about qualifying where we would put EDI, but the most common usage is boiler feed water or steam in many industries. Power is a, probably the very biggest one by far, but also used for power or steam, and that can be steam for uh, power generation or steam for uh, the end user's process in mining, oil and gas, petrochemical, pulp and paper, steel. Microelectronics, rinse water is also a very, another very big one. Uh, semiconductor being a very demanding industry requires very, very tight specs on that water produced out of the EDI and typically follows with many other unit operations. It's also used in flat panel display and solar photovoltaic cell production. Process uh, water or process steam and utilities used by chemical industry and then finally, water for injection or other utilities in the pharmaceutical and various lab industries. So there's quite a broad uh, uh, application in many different places, but it all comes down to ultra pure water. So let's compare a little bit about uh, 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 the operation of a mixed bed and the operation of an EDI. So this is a very quick review on mixed bed operation somewhere in the middle of its run. So we have a, I'm showing the feed water from the bottom and product water at the top, just in this schematic. The regen that was run the last time gave us a nearly completely regenerated batch of resin. As the water was run through, we start to exhaust the resin at the inlet end. That uh, becomes deeper and deeper. And uh, as the contaminant ions are depleted through the flow, you get a transition zone where your resin is partially depleted. And then of course, a regenerated zone that makes sure you get the most difficult to remove uh, con uh, contaminant ions. Now, the exhausted resin over time just gets deeper and deeper. The transition moves up and eventually you break through on whatever, um, whatever element of interest, whether that's resistivity, sodium, boron, then you have to stop production, separate the anion and cation exchange resins and regenerate them and you start all over again. EDI also has some mixed bed resin inside of it, but a much smaller amount for the flow rate that you have. And, and essentially what you have is little to no exhausted resin, mostly some transition zone at the inlet end, and then a nice deep a bed of regenerated resin. And the reason for this is we are applying power to remove the contaminant ions at the same rate as we're depositing them. So we have a, a design where we get to a steady state. So we continuously regenerate this resin. So an important point here is that is something that we never state explicitly, but is implicit. Being a batch process, 
mixed bed DI is an ion exchange and storage device. It stores the re the contaminants that were uh, exchanged onto the resin until you stop the batch process and separate it and regenerate it. EDI is a continuous process. So it's an ion exchange and transport device. So on the left side, ion exchange and storage device, batch. On the right side, continuous ion exchange and transport device. So let's go inside of a stack and have a look at how this is put together and how it does what it's got to do. So from my left side, I'm showing my feed. I didn't label it, but that's my feed water. It's going through this, what we call a stack. It's a plate and flame, plate and frame device in our, uh, in our version of it. There are other configurations, but it's basically a box put together in a construction like a plate and frame device, like you might see with a heat exchanger, for instance. It's one stack, it's a stack of, of chambers, one after the other. From the left side, in this case, I feed water from the right side. I feed water. So where is it coming from? Where is it going to? What does it do? So what I stack together is an arrangement of two electrodes, a bunch of membranes, and a bunch of ion exchange resin. Now, the ion exchange resin is the same kind of resin you'd see in a mixed bed deionization uh, vessel. Same. There's nothing, nothing special about this resin in most, uh, most uh, EDI devices. What you see uh, separating those resins are what I labeled here as anion membrane and cation membrane. That's short for anion exchange and cation exchange membrane. The material is again, the same as in the resin beads. It's just in flat sheet format. So what happens is I have water flowing through all of these chambers and I have these contaminant ions that enter. And what I will see in the inlet of every one of these spacers is the same kind of water. It's RO permeate or maybe second pass RO permeate. When I apply a voltage across this, what happens is I first of all see some ion exchange happening. This ion exchange resin captures those uh, contaminant ions, sodium, chloride, sulfate, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, all of them. What that allows this device to do is hang on to that long enough for the, uh, the resin to, to keep it and not allow it to exit at the right side. Rather, the, the uh, voltage that's applied here drives the cations in one direction, the anions in another direction. So I can see from this top, uh, if you look at the top left, I have blue arrows pointing up and down. The blue are showing my anions being moved from this chamber up through this anion membrane and into the anode. If I go one chamber down, I see it going up through an anion membrane and into what I've labeled as my concentrating chamber. And what happens is my anions want to keep going. However, they encounter a cation membrane, they cannot pass through it. They don't exchange onto the cation membrane. So they are trapped in this concentrating chamber until the water flowing through that concentrating chamber from right to left in this diagram carries it out. And the same thing happens for the cation, cations from the, uh, the adjacent diluting spacer. They're brought through the cation membrane into that same concentrating spacer and carried out. Now, if we design our box correctly, if we design our process right, out the right side, we are going to get high purity water that meets, hopefully, our customers' requirements with the right design of, uh, of EDI and right design of the pretreatment. And if needed, any post-treatment, uh, this is going to do that job. Now, I've only told you about two parts so far, but there's actually a third step that's needed to get that high purity of water. So I'm going to show you very quickly here in a cartoon format, the concurrent processes in electrodeionization. So ion exchange I've talked about, 
And here we're just showing the chloride displacing a hydroxyl line that's on the, the anion resin bead, the regenerated resin bead. And the cation that's on the cation bead, sodium displaces the hydrogen ion and that forms water again in the water stream. The second step is, is ion transport. So here I'm showing a continuous path of cation resin beads on top and anion resin beads on the bottom. So as long as an anion uh, bumps into one of these anion beads anywhere along this path, it exchanges onto that anion bead and under the influence of that voltage gets driven to the right from ion exchange site to the next ion exchange site, from one bead to another, from bead to membrane, and then through the membrane into that concentrating space around the other side. Again, that wants to keep going, but uh, over here on the bar, very far right, which I haven't shown, is another cation membrane. It can't pass through. The concentrate flow, concentrate space or flow take, carries that away. And then for the cations, the same thing happens. It has to be a continuous path of cation material, whether bead or membrane. That Those get moved in the opposite direction. Now, if this was all I did, I would get demineralization. I wouldn't get really good clean water, high removal of those most difficult to remove species like CO2, silica. They need to be ionized inside of the, of the uh, spacer, the diluting spacer. And so they need to have high pH areas to ionize them, which is going to happen when we do water splitting. We actually apply more of our power to do water splitting then we do removing the contaminant ions. So we have water at the interface between a cation bead and an anion bead. The hyd uh, hydrogen ion that results from that water split is exchanged onto a cation bead. The uh, hydroxyl ion is exchanged onto the anion bead, and then they make their way over left for the cations in this case, right for the anions. And this actually ends up resulting in, if we again, if we design correctly, resulting in a very, very highly regenerated bed. The majority of the bed in, an, in a DI, EDI device that needs to make 16 megaohm centimeter water, 5 ppb of silica, maybe gets a very low PPT of boron, needs to have most of the resin in this highly regenerated form. So we end up spending by far a majority of our, of our current doing water splitting rather than contaminant removal. And so at the outlet end, I'm gonna back up one slide and show you at this left side, this will be this transition zone resin where we have some contaminant ions and maybe some hydrogen hydroxyl. But by the time we get close to the middle of this chamber going from left to right, this resin is all going to be highly or fully regenerated. So we're able to ionize silica and CO2. And then once they're ionized, exchange onto the resin, carry them away like all other resin uh, uh, contaminants. Hey, um, oh. Tom, just so that we don't don't run out of time because we're going just, just over right now, would you mind touching the, um, I know, remember you had mentioned something between the prediction versus projection. Yep. And yeah. how does that work? So uh, I'm going to skip over this sliding because it really leads to this last one, which is about feed water requirements and product water quality. And so you can see feed water requirements by comparing fact sheets being very similar among most EDIs. Where they differentiate is in their performance and the product water quality. And one thing that you need to be able to do is be able to get to the water quality you need. So there's a, there are a lot of tools from different manufacturers out there. Some are uh, prediction tools, some are projection tools, uh, or a combination. And the difference between those is a prediction tool is really just going to give you uh, the calculations for general good operation, but they're not going to uh, they're not going to give you a guarantee on the more stringent requirements like meeting a silica removal, but not at a percentage level, an actual value like what your customer is going to, your end user is going to need, which is, hey, I, I need to make sure there's no more than five PBB. So projections with guarantees will give you that. 
they will actually include in the projection tool the word guarantee. And you don't need to come talk to me to ask me, is this guaranteed if our projection tool shows us that? You may have a prediction tool that says, OK, if you operate it in sort of this average default mode, uh, you'll get pretty good resistivity. Uh, it might not even tell you what the silica will be. So not everybody needs a projection. If you need predictions only, then that is you need a sense of how what quality water is going to be uh, coming out the end of the EDI. Any of the manufacturer's tools are going to be adequate. But do you need, if you need product water guarantees, a prediction only tool isn't enough. In that case, you have to work with the manufacturer's rep for guarantees on specific uh, specific parameters. To get from that prediction only tool uh, and the parameters it, it, that will display for you, you're going to need to talk to that rep and, and that is going to make the operating requirements more stringent than a prediction only tool. And, and one that's probably of most interest to most people is the power consumption. So if you want real apples to apples comparisons on competing EDIs, you need to get to that final projection. So in the case of Suez's uh, uh, tool, it is mostly projections, but it has some predictions. And we put in the most common parameters that are requested projections for like resistivity and silica. We do put a prediction on product sodium, product chloride and product sulfate. Uh, if you want us to guarantee it, you can come and ask, uh, talk to us about it, and we'll decide if um, we can do that just based on that and uh, give you the uh, guarantee. Or will you need to do will you need to do something else to run it uh, more uh, uh, in in a way that maybe requires more uh, more operating current? or some other uh, some other ad adjustment to the operating parameters to be able to get to that guarantee. And this is the other thing. Um, if, uh, if you do run a tool, whether it's a prediction tool or projection tool, and what it tells you isn't what you're looking for, this is another reason to go to the manufacturer's rep to talk to them, because a lot of times uh, we're going to be able to make a recommendation on how you might be able to make adjustments to hit the quality of water you're looking for. And that's whether it's a prediction or a projection tool. And well, thank uh, you. that's thank it. You, so that was, let's move to questions. Yeah. Yes, that, that was a lot of information to pack in. We're just running it a little bit at a time here, and we want to make sure that we're conscious of everybody's time. Now, I have a, uh, my list of questions is a little too long, but maybe we can open it up. I know that we normally have a chat box uh, we can get some um, information in there. I guess my first one was you had mentioned something along the continuous regeneration of going through your membranes, uh, yeah. or rather your, the, the ion exchange portion of the cation versus anion membranes. Uh, how does the continuous regeneration work? So the continuous regeneration works by applying continuously operating current. So when I talk about current, you're always running some, some current through it that drives Ion, so you use electrical current to drive ion current, and that ionic current is the uh, contaminant ions that are exchanged first onto those resins in the diluting spacer and then moved from. So that's the ion migration piece. So when we apply current, it drives those, those anions to follow that path of anion beads to the anion membrane across into the concentrating chamber where it's trapped and carried away. And same with the cations. Uh, cations in one direction, anions in the other direction. Okay, and then I, I love the prediction versus projection. I think that's very important. When you're doing a performance guarantee on something, you can't just say, you know, you can't just predict a number. There has to be a very specific correlation to the projection. So I love that. That's that's kind of a, a mix of words sometimes in syntax, but but once you come and take a look at comparing the two, it's just important to differentiate the, uh, both. And then um, you'd mentioned that these are in stack, of course. And so I've got two two questions there is, is there, and I'm sure that will be part of the projection model, but is there a maximum TDS or some kind of solid loadings that you might recommend going into these? I know it's hard to just come up with a number, but, you know, right. post RO, are we looking at under 10 parts, five parts, 50 parts? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, reference our, what we call our nominal flow, uh, which is on an ESL 3X stack, for instance, we have a maximum flow of 28 GPM. 
Uh, 22 GPM is our nominal flow or five cubic meters per hour. And there, what we say is at that five cubic meters per hour, 22 GPM, 25 Celsius and 77 Fahrenheit, uh, you can feed as much as 25 PPM of TEA. Now that's not the same thing as TDS. I'm, I'm not gonna cover it too much, but I'll just point out that it's just uh, a calculation of ionic load. TA is anionic load and TEC is cationic load. So you can go to 25 ppm uh, to get 16 megaohm centimeter guaranteed in our version of the UDI stack. Now, another way to look at it, and I, I personally don't like using it, but it can sometimes be a handy reference, and that's a feed equivalent. So the feed equivalent to 25, conductivity equivalent to 25 ppm of TA is about 40 microsiemens. The wow, reason we use very TEA, high water. Yes. Yeah. The reason we use TEA though is it better captures things like CO2, which has a has a complex uh, conductivity concentration curve. It's not just a straight curve. I shouldn't say complex, but it's not straight, it's curved. So it's not necessarily caught very well in that conductivity. So that's why we talk about a conductivity equivalent. Uh, CO2, by the way, uh, is one of the most important questions to ask about your feed water because everybody knows what their conductivity is, but sometimes people forget to figure out, figure their CO2 into the equation, and it's an important anion. It's in pretty much every water we see go through an EDI. That's right. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for, for your time. I know that you can go on this for a couple hours, so I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we are trying to keep it short here. Um, so we've got your contact information in there. Please make sure you reach out. If you have any questions, please go ahead. We do have some upcoming webinars. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. We also have our YouTube channel there. Um, so uh, for the next two weeks, um, I, now that the uh, you know borders are open, kind of COVID is kind of really um, opening up a lot of these conferences, I will be on the road. So we might have to be delaying some of these webinars. So it'll be looking more like two or three weeks, but Check your inbox, you'll be invited uh, soon enough. And with that, thank you very much. If you want to stick around for some questions, uh, please do. Um, both Tom and I will be on here and, and try to answer some of them. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Perfect.